I'm Aaron Klein. I'm a fellow in economic studies, and I'm the policy director for our Center on Markets and Regulation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here to engage in what I think is kind of a critically important but often underthought of issue in our broad economy, which is where are we in terms of our position about anti-money laundering rules, laws, and regulation? Uh, I think a lot of folks uh, here would remember, uh, and, and that, uh, as Rajan reminded me earlier today, that Al Capone may be America's most famous gangster, but he did not go to jail for any violent crime. He went to jail for a financial crime. Financial crimes have been a tool of law enforcement for a wide variety of purposes for decades. The comprehensive anti-money laundering system that we start with as a predicate was formed in the late 1960s with a goal to catch the mafia and tax evaders. With dollar thresholds for transaction reportings of the then princely sum of $10,000, which was more than an average median, uh, the average worker er earned over a year, or as I once wrote, found in an infographic, for $10,000 in cash, you could buy a fully loaded brand new Cadillac at the time this law was passed. In point of fact, you could buy two Cadillacs in cash, fully loaded, no transaction reporting. From the 60s and 70s era of catching tax cheats and the mob, the system was transformed and bootstrapped in the 80s to catch the new threat, drug cartels, with a broader focus on international flows of funds and different geography, the system was expanded. 18 years ago today, a new threat arose to America and Congress responded in the Patriot Act with a section broadening our anti-money laundering regime strategies and goals on a new and incredibly important focus that remains with us today, terrorism. Ancillary regimes were set up to deal with sanctions and other financial crimes and financial tools the U.S. government institutes for foreign policy, domestic policy, and to protect our citizens. Eighteen years later, I think it's important to ask, do we have the system we wanted to and are designed? Today, because we didn't index a number in 1968, that same $10,000 threshold means that you cannot buy a single new car in America in cash without getting a transaction report being filed when the original intent was meant to permit what, you know anybody from walking in and buying not one but two Cadillacs. You can pick your, your thing. You can pay your college tuition. I don't even want to tell you what that's done. Uh, this system on autopilot may not be the optimal system. It may not. Certainly, we can all agree the threats that we face today are radically different than the threats we faced 50 years ago. And in point of fact, this... What we've learned in the 18 years since today's events ought to better inform policy for the next 18 years. Uh, deciding to hold this event, I thought to, to myself and others, who are the experts that we'd want to hear from? And I think there's no better person to start this than Congresswoman Maloney. Congresswoman Maloney has been a, a leader on Capitol Hill for an incredibly long time. She currently serves as the vice chair of the Joint Economic Committee, and she was the former chair, and I might add the first woman to chair the Congress's Joint Economic Committee, started in 1948, and, and I think it took too long to get our first female chair, and hopefully we'll have another one so soon enough. Uh, she's also one of the most senior members of the House Financial Services Committee. She's currently the chair on the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets. She's chaired multiple other subcommittees. She's passed multiple bills. I remember very fondly legislation that she championed in the House and my former boss, Senator Chris Dodd, championed in the Senate, the CARD Act. Uh, the CARD Act was a giant deal. It enhanced consumer protection and stopped abuses. It changed what's in all of your wallets and how that's regulated. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Maloney was described by Money Magazine as, quote, the best friend a credit card user ever had, end quote, which makes her many of our best friends in this room. Uh, but today, as the 18th anniversary of the horrific events of September 11, 2001, remind us, Congresswoman Maloney is from New York. And there's no more place more impacted than New York. And not only did she fight 
at the time for those victims. She, she authored the James Ardoga 9-11 Health and Compensation Act to make sure all those suffering health ailments associated with 9-11 get the medical compensation and care they need and deserve. That money eventually ran out, but Congresswoman Maloney never stopped. She continued that fight, and this year led the successful reauthorization and replenishment of that fund to keep funding available for those who continue to suffer from 9-11. So I think it's all appropriate for us to both thank her for those continuing efforts, and then at the same time in our thanks to take a silent moment to remember and honor the victims of 9-11 18 years ago today. With that as a backdrop, Congressman Maloney, thank you for joining us at Brookings today and to share your thoughts on how our nation's anti-money laundering laws have evolved and where we need to go from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you uh, for, for letting me uh, join you today. Uh, this, this topic is uh, very timely because we've been uh, working very hard this year to find a bipartisan path uh, forward on reforms to the anti-money laundering system. And the central component of these re reforms is a bill that I've authored called the Corporate Transparency Act, which would crack down on the illicit use of anonymous shell companies. This is one of the most pressing national security problems we face in this country because anonymous shell companies are the vehicle of choice for money launderers, criminals, and terrorists. The reason they're so popular is because they can't be traced back to their true owners. Shell companies allow criminals and terrorists to move money around in the US financial system and finance their operations freely and legally. Unfortunately, we know that the U.S. is one of the easiest places in the entire world to set up anonymous shell companies. The reason why these shell companies are anonymous is because states don't require companies to name their true beneficial owners, the individuals who are collecting the profits and who outright own the company. We are the only, the only advanced country in the world that doesn't already require disclosure of this information. And frankly, it's an embarrassment. When the Panama Papers came out last year, one of the most common questions is why weren't there more Americans involved? And the answer is that Americans don't have to go to Panama to set up anonymous shell companies. They can do it right here in the United States. But this isn't just an embarrassment we need to address, it's a problem that we really need to fix. These shell companies leave a gaping hole in our national security strategy. And the longer we wait to fix this problem, the more we put our country at risk. As any FBI agent or prosecutor will tell you, far too many of their investigations hit a dead end at an anonymous shell company. And because they can't find out who the real owner of that shell company is, they can't follow the money past the shell company, past this pile of cash that they know is financing illegal activity. The, trial, uh, the trail goes cold, and the investigation is stopped dead in its tracks. Treasury conducted a pilot program a couple of years ago where they collected beneficial ownership uh, information for real estate transactions in Manhattan and Miami for six months, and the results were stunning. Treasury found that about 30% of the transactions reported in those six months involved a beneficial owner or purchaser representative that had previously been the subject of a suspicious activity report. In other words, these were potentially suspicious people buying these properties. And this was after Treasury and the press had announced to the world that they would be collecting beneficial ownership information in these two cities for six months. So this didn't even capture uh, the criminals and the money launderers who simply avoided those two cities for this month, this six month period. My bill would solve this problem by requiring companies to disclose their true beneficial owners to FinCEN at the time the company is formed. This information would only be available to law enforcement and to financial institutions so that they can comply with their know your customer 
rules. This bill will plug a huge hole in our national security defenses and would be a massive benefit to law enforcement. But this bill would also shore up the safety of our financial system and would streamline the compliance costs for financial institutions that are trying to make sure that terrorists and criminals aren't secretly using U.S. banks uh, to move money around. Treasury passed a rule three years ago that requires financial institutions to collect the beneficial ownership information for all of their corporate customers, which was a very important rule. If you think about it, no American, none of us, can walk into a branch, a, a bank anywhere, and open up an account without identifying ourselves, saying what our name is, what our address is, and providing some proof that we are who we say we are. So why should companies be able to open up bank accounts and just deposit millions, even billions of dollars, without also identifying who owns them? FinCEN's rule fixes that loophole, and I think it makes our financial system safer. But it also puts the burden on the financial institutions to collect the information, rather than putting the burden on the companies themselves. My bill would streamline this process by allowing financial institutions to access the FinCEN database of beneficial ownership information. That way, financial institutions will be able to better police the financial system because they will truly know who their customers are and will also ease the regulatory burden on financial institutions at the same time. This is a win-win. It helps law enforcement. It helps financial institutions better protect the U.S. financial system. And it also reduces a necessary regulatory burden. I want to take some time to address some of the concerns that have been raised about the bill because I think these concerns are now well-founded. First, some people have claimed that it would be overly burdensome on small businesses. But I don't think that that is true at all. All, all of the experience in other countries that already collect beneficial ownership information has proven that it is very cheap for small businesses to comply. Critics have been made these wild claims about my bill costing small businesses millions of dollars and a lot of time. But in the UK, where they already collect this information, the cost of compliance for the average small business was only $200, and that's a one-time cost. To me, that is a very modest price to pay for national security. In the UK, the median com uh, company that uh, had 1.1 owners, which means that the vast majority of small businesses only have one owner. So for these businesses, they will only have to file one name with FinCEN, just one, just one name. And we're only asking for four pieces of very basic information, your name, date of birth, current address, driver's license number. For most businesses owners, it would take them five minutes to collect this information at most. According to a study by the Global Financial Integrity, uh, you have to disclose more information to get a library card than you have to disclose to create a corporation or an LLC. And you don't hear people complaining about the burdens of getting a library card. So I think the idea that this disclosure would be unduly burdensome is simply false. The bill also goes out of its way to exempt every category of business that already discloses their beneficial owners either to regulators or in public filings. This includes banks, credit unions, insurance companies, investment advisors, brokers, utilities, and nonprofits. The bill even exempts companies with more than 20 employees and over $5 million in revenues. Because if you have 20 employees and are actually generating a significant amount of revenue, then you're almost certainly a real business, not a shell company that is being used to launder money. In fact, in almost all of the cases where law enforcement has uncovered a shell company that is being used for illicit purchases, the company had either zero or one employee. That's why we felt comfortable exempting companies that have more than 20 employees. So I think we've come a long way out of our way uh, to ensure that the bill is appropriately tailored and is not 
burdensome on small businesses. Second, most uh, people, some people, have suggested that the IRS should collect this information and not FinCEN. Having the IRS collect this information would pose significant problems because the IRS has very strict rules on sharing information it collects. So law enforcement agencies, the fundamental reason why we want this bill, law enforcement agencies would not be able to access the information and financial institutions certainly wouldn't be able to access the information. Why would we want to collect beneficial ownership information if law enforcement can't even use it? That would undermine the entire point of the bill. So I fundamentally oppose the IRS approach to beneficial ownership collection. The approach I've taken in my bill is the product of years of work and years of uh, compromises with different stakeholders, all with a view to building the broadest possible coalition of support. And I think that we've built a very large coalition. We have the support of 127 NGOs, all of the law enforcement groups, all of them, all of the banking trade associations, the credit union trade associations, human rights groups, state secretaries of state, most of the real estate industry, and many more. We passed the bill out of committee with a healthy bipartisan support, which is rare in this Congress. And I'm hopeful that the bill will pass the full House in October. We also have significant momentum in the Senate, where Senators Warner, Cotton, Jones, and Rounds released a discussion draft that contained a beneficial ownership title that is very similar to my bill. In addition, Senators Whitehouse and Grassley have introduced a companion beneficial ownership bill in the Senate Judiciary Committee, which the chairman of that committee, Lindsey Graham, has indicated he wants to move. And Chairman Crapo and Ranking Member Sherrod Brown on the Senate Banking Committee have held multiple hearings on beneficial ownership and have indicated that they're interested in moving legislation on this topic as well. Finally, we've been working very productively with the administration. Treasury Secretary Mnuchin testified in support of beneficial ownership legislation several times and supports a bipartisan approach to the issue. So I'm very, very optimistic that the stars have finally aligned for beneficial ownership this Congress and that this bill will become law. I think there's broad agreement that our AML system could be both more effective and less burdensome. And so we're working hard to strike the right balance and to get these reforms across the finish line. And with that, I'd like to thank the Brookings Institution for inviting me to speak at this fabulous event. And I think, I think we're going to take some questions now, but I want to thank you for the work that you do all year long and have done in the past and will do in the future. Thank you for having me. And as one who represents the 9-11 city, I have to say it's very, it's very uh, poignant that it, today we're having this discussion because this need for this and my passion for passing this bill is totally tied to national security where law enforcement tells me over and over again they're tracking the money and then they hit a wall it's an llc and they can't find out anything more so i think it's needed i think it's important and i hope very much that we'll be able to pass it this year thank you and i'll take questions sure Aaron, i'll take questions you want to, should we sit down no, I'll, I'll take questions from standing. Uh, yes, uh-huh. Does your bill at all address the movement of money from the United States to other countries? And I'm thinking specifically of the UAE, I'm thinking of China, I'm thinking of Russia. Um, that kind of ends up being another black hole in terms of... You know, I, I heard your question. Uh, he says, does it address moving of the money from, say, for example, the UAE across various countries and around the world? And I would say yes, because you'd be able to see who the beneficial owner is. I have had cases where I have filed CFIUS complaints saying that I felt that this 
account of, and, who they, and who was trying to buy this company was hiding behind an LLC and was a foreign bad actor and should not own this particular company in America. And I won one time. Uh, and they didn't, they, they said, oh, we're going to sell it. We don't care. It's, a, it's, a, it's okay. And I said, you've got to tell me who's buying it. And uh, Treasury came back and they said they traced the money from one country to another country to another country to another country to another country. They could never find out whose money it was or who was really behind that LLC. So it would stop that. But what I find so startling about this, I think of our country as being a trendsetter, as setting uh, a high standard. Practically every single country in the world, uh, the EU, England, all of our allies, they, they know who's buying property in, in their area. Um, I represent New York City, uh, the east side of Manhattan. You can ride down the meet east side of Manhattan at night, look up at buildings, and there are buildings that are completely, they don't have one light on. They don't have one light on. And they are bank accounts. People don't live there. People, and it's a way you can stash money. And whenever we have a terrorist attack, and we've had many attempts, uh, some have been somewhat successful since 9-11, Heard only a few people, but still too, too many people. And, and, uh, and, and law enforcement will say, well, where did they get the money? Who financed it? And it's so easy now. You just buy an apartment. You've got a bank account that you can then pull the money out whenever you want. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, what was your... Pardon me, the what? What would your bill do? Any rate, um, thank you. Uh, what would your bill do to help reduce our debt and deficit? Well, this is not a, a, a deficit reduction bill. This is, uh, it's not a tax bill. It's a law enforcement bill. It's who is buying America, who owns it. Uh, law enforcement tell me and others repeatedly that they will be tracking money, and, and they will uh, hit a, a wall. They'll hit an LLC. They can't find out. They, they know that it's uh, sex trafficking money. They know it's illegal guns. They know it's dope. They know it's bad activity, but they can't find out who owns it. They're completely protected. And there are no taxes? Not really with the bill. I would, th I would say that it would crack down on money laundering, hiding money, uh, possibly would have that a benefit that they'd find out someone is hiding a huge amount of money that they should be paying taxes on. And, uh, and uh, a lot of our, our, our real estate in New York is bought by foreign people, foreign countries. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. I, I find it startling. I just ride down the street and I just look at these empty buildings and they are just basically bank accounts. Yes. Um, thanks, Robert Charetta, international investor. Uh, it seems like there's a number of constituents that would be fighting you. Uh, real estate agents, for one, as you mentioned. Uh, also, of course, uh, some attorneys and law firms. And I understand that within each individual state, this, they call them sometimes uh, secretaries of state, sometimes other names, but they also uh, are against such legislation because they bring in a certain amount of income by setting up these corporations. So can you tell me how you intend to overcome those uh, in resistance, and who are the constituents in favor of this? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, uh, we've built a, a huge coalition. And in fact, the secretaries of state have come out in support of the bill. They don't want to do it. They don't want to keep these registries. And uh, they have all come out and signed papers and support the bill. So secretaries of state support the bill. And, and uh, uh, every single group. Now, originally, the real estate industry makes a great deal of money selling real estate. So originally, they were not in support of the bill. But now they support it. The, the, realtors, the realtors organization has come out in support of the bill. Uh, I think it's because of national security. Quietly, how, quite frankly, 
how dumb can you be? If you know terrorists are, can hide money so easily in your country, why in the world are you letting that happen? And, and uh, when we're trying so hard, and as I said, we had 127 NGOs. Uh, what is really interesting to me, I've worked very hard to build a coalition that could pass it. Uh, law enforcement's totally for it. Usually when law enforcement says, help me protect you, give me the tools to do the job to protect you, it happens. And so your point is true. There is a opposition to it, a lot of opposition to it, and, and uh, because they, the law enforcement is saying, I will be better able to protect you, yet the bill hasn't passed. So uh, the, the only group that has come out in opposition, you know, the, all the, the, the banking groups have, are now supporting it. At first, they didn't. The trade uh, associations, the credit unions, the human rights groups, the secretaries of state, and, and very importantly, the real estate industry, which probably makes more money off of it than anybody, is the real estate industry. And now they are officially supporting the bill. The one organization that has come out in opposition is the uh, lawyers, the Lawyers Association. And uh, they say because it is so burdensome to small businesses, that's why I spent so much time uh, going through the points showing out that it is not uh, burdensome to them. There is a 60-minute program that was uh, put together, and uh, you can get it on 60 Minutes, and uh, it goes through going to, they go to 13, it's a sham. It's a, they, they have some guy come in and says he's representing, a, you, know, a, you know, a prime minister in Africa, and he has so much money, he needs, you know, five houses and two boats, and, uh, and he wants to hide a, a billion dollars in America, from, in, in, and uh, they go through 12 lawyers that tell them, you've come to the right place. They say, they say, whatever you do, don't go to a bank because they will reveal who you are. And, but I can hide it. I can hide it. Only one said, what you're doing is illegal. Get out of my office. But they, they document it. And I suggest you watch this film. Uh, most people, when they see this film afterwards, are more dedicated to passing the bill and making it part of uh, the fabric of, uh, of America uh, after seeing this bill. It'll make you quite angry. Hi, my name is Deborah Ray. I actually report on the Canadian stock market. And so, uh, you know, you were talking about hiding drug money, laundering drug money. And I was wondering if you were concerned about activities going on in marijuana stocks, especially with the can trust scandal where they're putting up fake walls and hiding uh, some of their production efforts which are not licensed? Well, uh, we, I, I think that's a very a good question, but uh, we have a bill that we have reported out of committee that uh, addresses the cannabis banking issue, which I think is a really important one. We have roughly 12 states that have legalized uh, cannabis in their states. And it has become really a national, I would call it a, a police security uh, problem because many people are hiding huge amounts of money because they have no access to a banking system. And what this bill would do, it would allow, if your state has legal marijuana, then your banks can legally bank it in that state uh, so they're, they're trying to address that particular challenge. Right. And um, something that I'm concerned about is because these marijuana companies like Canopy Growth and Aurora Cannabis, they are actually making partnerships with legal marijuana producers in Colombia because Colombia has legalized marijuana since 2016. But my concern is some of the money that is being exchanged is actually money that was made by the cartels when it was illegal, and it's actually blood money. Well, I, I, do, I can't talk about the blood yeah. money. Each, each case is different. Uh, we are trying to address the challenge of banking cannabis in right. this country, uh, and uh, we're moving forward with that legislation. I, I believe that it will be... Uh, uh, I, I, there's a huge effort uh, to decriminalize uh, marijuana, 
and uh, I believe that will happen also, and that's happening in many states. Uh, it almost passed in my home state of New York, and it's happened in several other states, and I think that that, <coughs> that change is moving forward. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, uh-huh. Uh, thank you. Uh, corporations are chartered by states. Are there any specific states that are the worst offenders in this area? I really don't. I don't know because we don't. We don't have. Um, we don't have any records on it yet now. But of who's because the law enforcement will go up to a wall, but they can't prove who's behind that wall. So we don't have any. I, I would say that my own state, New York, because so much, so I'd say my own district is obviously, uh, uh, has many LLCs that no one lives in those apartments or in those co-ops. I don't know who charters each one. It could be chartered federally. It could be chartered in New York State. It could be chartered some other state. Um, all of the state the secretaries of state from every single state has signed support of this legislation. There is not one state that is saying that they want to have their separate system. Yes, uh-huh, in the back row. Uh, yes. Uh, have you gotten any estimates from law enforcement on how this bill might impact civil asset forfeiture? Pardon me? How the bill would affect civil asset forfeiture, so if all these anonymous companies are made known, uh, will they be able to seize more money for, that's been generated illicitly? Probably. Again, it's an individual situation. Uh, my, my particular interest and focus is terrorism. I represent New York City. We lost uh, 3,000 people on that day because they went to work like you are doing today just because they're American citizens. It's pretty horrifying. We've been dealing with the ramifications of it ever since, uh, trying to rebuild and trying to help people repair, and uh, it's uh, devastating. So I, I feel if law enforcement says this is going to help me protect you from terrorism, I'm for it, period. It will also uh, help law enforcement crack down on other illegal activities such as money laundering and hi hiding uh, sex trafficking monies and so forth. Yes, uh-huh. Congresswoman, I, I'll take the opportunity maybe to, to uh, ask the last question. Building on what you said, because the events of 18 years ago kind of changed everything, and our AML regime was enhanced through the Patriot Act, uh, but 20 years later, we have a system that's very broad. We're trying to catch a lot of different folks. Uh, uh, it's also expensive. AML compliance costs are, when I do research, are often cited as the number one reason why financial institutions don't offer low and no cost bank accounts because of the cost of compliance. I wrote a paper with Karen Gifford, who will be joining the panel shortly, and Michael Barr was Assistant Secretary uh, for Financial Institutions at the Treasury Department. Uh, and in the, in the paper we quote that we found Enabling individuals to own their identity details in digitized form offers the possibility of enhancing personal privacy and information security. Portable digital identity supports financial inclusion efforts by reducing or eliminating expensive and repetitive data, repetitive data collection associated with customer onboarding at banks, end quote. You know, what do you, you know, historically bank regulators have not exactly been at the cutting edge in accepting new technology for proof of identity. And as you well know, the federal government isn't really in the identity business. That's we leave for the, mm -hmm. for the states uh, and for the local libraries and their rigorous library card regimes, which I can attest are, are quite challenging in Montgomery County. Uh, what do you think can be done to help make it easier and cheaper for people to prove to financial institutions that they are themselves and correspondingly to allow financial institutions to lower the cost of customer onboarding to hopefully uh, attack this debanking and de-risking problem. Well, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Aaron. Uh, we need to leverage new technologies to make it easier for people to prove their identities. And 
your point that this would allow them to open up accounts for the unbanked without charges, I think is an excellent one. I'll add it to my talking points. I think it's a, a great idea. But it, you, we could uh, do a better job of leveraging our existing uh, databases. And in fact, I have another bill in on the TSA PreCheck database. They say they now have 12 million people in the TSA PreCheck database. And I have a bill in that that database banks should be able to access for Know Your Customer. Um, I remember when we put Know Your Customer as a burden on the banks, they were all extremely upset about the high cost, particularly the regional banks and smaller banks. They just couldn't absorb it. And they were constantly coming to me telling me how hard it was for them. And if we could leverage this with this bill, with the TSA, then we could cut down, streamline, and make it much more efficient. I, I fly to Washington every week, and, and the TSA line is now longer than the other line. You know, and eventually it's going to continue to grow. And uh, so, and I, I, I would say that their checking is, and, and the global entry also is uh, very extensive. They, they really check it. it. It takes them weeks to come back with whether or not you've met their criteria. So I think that's a very important database that we should also uh, push that would be a database that, along your idea. But your idea also of uh, being for more unbanked to have the ability to be banked because the, the, the burden of know your customer is such an important one to the financial institutions. They don't want to make a mistake on something as important as national security. So it's extremely costly and they are very uh, a concern that they may not catch something and, and, and it's, a, it's a huge uh, burden uh, in time and money and effort, with, which is if we combine these, this would move forward. I just have to share with you some of my colleagues on uh, the banking committee went to uh, some of the banking capitals. They went to Cyprus, which is the money laundering capital of the world. And guess what? They're moving forward with uh, beneficial ownership. It's time for us to move forward with beneficial ownership. Anyway, thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.